Some years ago, the New Yorker magazine, a very well-respected magazine, ran a long article on media mogul Ted Turner's life. This article was both a summary of his accomplishments and a very deep take on his mindset. It detailed his rise from adolescent troublemaker to founder of CNN, TBS, TNT, the Cartoon Network, to owner of the Atlanta Braves, to becoming the country's largest landowner, to donating over a billion dollars to the United Nations. Wow, this guy's really done it all. And this article is so in-depth, it was almost like reading a book. So let's take a look at this man, Ted Turner's life. He's had material success, worth billions of dollars. He can buy what he wants, when he wants it, no question asked. His 2 million acres of land that he owns speaks for itself. He's had worldly, politically correct, liberal success. He's championed land conservation and women's liberal issues like the right to choose. He fits right into that paradigm. He identifies with uh, being someone that really cares deeply about the climate and the current situation in the world. He's dined with presidents. Many of these presidents call him a friend. And he's been embraced by popular culture as one of the greatest innovators of all time. There's documentaries on him. There's these long reports like I read. I mean, this guy's a legend. He's a celebrity, too. He was once married to Jane Fonda and oft times would don the tabloid covers of magazines and newspapers. He's got intellect. He's not just a run-of-the-mill celebrity. He's a smart man, spent several years studying classics at Brown. He's given millions to Harvard's endowment. He's no dummy. This guy has embodied everything the world has told us will make us happy. He's educated, super successful, filthy rich, very well connected, and wait for it, he's on edge. Yeah, he's not happy at all. Much of the New Yorker article focused on his near constant state of inner anxiety, his feelings of being wronged, his insecurities, his lack of control. This man is so far from peace, it's not funny. Now let's look at this. What a striking contradiction we have here. A man that in every way achieved what society would define as success in all facets of life is completely messed up. Ted Turner describes himself as agnostic or atheist. He's tried drugs to calm him down. That didn't work. He's tried charity. That didn't work. He's tried acquiring new businesses and that didn't work either. No, he's just not able to figure it out on his own. See, Ted Turner's not alone. None of us are. When we live in this world, we are living in a world where sin is value, valued and promoted. If we aren't geared up and locked into the Bible, the inherent and fallible word of God, we are easy prey. While we're on the topic of the TV biz, let's look at three of the new major network TV shows premiering in 2016. I simply took these summaries These one-sentence summaries from the IMDB website, a very popular website. Okay, three shows here. First one, Angel from Hell, CBS. Allison isn't quite sure if her new friend Amy is her guardian angel or a crazy person. All right, next one, Lucifer, Fox. Satan takes up residence in Los Angeles. And explicitly, this is the same network that is hosting a Christian-themed live musical in March to celebrate Easter. Damien, A&E. After discovering his origins, Damien Thorne must cope with life as the Antichrist. This is not a coincidence, folks. I just plucked these three shows out of the 2016 lineup. This is a large example, both in pop culture and in the profile of Ted Turner, of our world, of how the world is valuing sin. We're all vulnerable to this. Remember, Ted Turner had all the wealth and worldly success and connections anyone could ever ask for, and he's still openly anxious, upset, and I'll even say miserable. Why? Because the devil comes only to... dot, 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 John 10, 10 through 29. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy... I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Wait, did you catch that last bit there? That they might have life. Yes, life. See, when we focus on God and his will, he gives us life. Real, true, peaceful life. It says it in the Bible. Isaiah 26.3 
Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. See, we have to trust. It's our obedience that gives us that peace, our obedience to God. We have to trust God. So if we trust God, all of our problems will just go away, right? No, no, they won't. They'll still be there. But you'll have a new power, the Holy Spirit, to help you deal with them. Being a Christian, trusting in Christ, it's the ultimate protection for the battlefield that we call life. By trusting in Christ, seeking forgiveness for our sins, repenting, and keeping our focus on him each and every day, our hearts are at peace and we're armed to battle the enemy. Again, it says it right in his word. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Can I pause and just mention again the TV shows I had just listed? Okay, right. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins grit about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God." Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. There's a whole lot in that scripture, but I want to focus today on this idea of putting on the armor to be protected from the devil. You can have all the money in the world, all the money that was ever printed, but without the armor of God, you are unable to withstand the devil. The Bible, the Bible tells us this much. Peter 5, 8, be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. How can you defend yourself from an enemy you don't know is attacking you? And see, that's the disconnect, right? That's what's happening here. We have believers reading their Bible. We have non-believers not reading the Bible. And if non-believers would just take a look at our world and just spend some time reading the Bible, they would understand too that all life is pointless without Christ. He died for our sins. He is the great redeemer and putting on the armor of God will protect us. This view of man being anything but sinful is elementary. We know it, but who chooses to ignore it and who chooses to do something about it? That's the difference between having peace and having pain. Growing up, I always thought there was some catch-all solution. Something that would completely fix my problems without any kind of supernatural uh, power. Even though I witnessed many people from all walks of life endure hardship and pain, rich, poor, young, old, I somehow thought there was some way to avoid it. I thought, well, maybe I could educate myself out of this struggle. Maybe I could earn my way out of the struggle with good deeds. Maybe I could buy my way out of the struggle with money. Maybe I could network my way out of the struggle with connections. No, no, all these ideas, every single one of them, I tried and they failed. I've had friends, good friends, but they couldn't stop the trials and tribulations of life from coming my way. I've had education, lots of it, but those degrees didn't keep struggle at bay. I've had money and I wasn't afraid to spend it. And yet I couldn't pay my way out of life's struggles. No, nothing. None of that worked. In fact, I would argue the more faith that I put into these worldly paths for peace and fulfillment, the more let down I was when those trees didn't bear fruit. If I had read my Bible more, this would have become abundantly clear. John 15, 1 through 5. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. 
I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. You heard that, right? Nothing. That's kind of what I was getting at. I kept hitting the wall of nothing. So stubborn as I am, I eventually, after plenty of tries, trying to do it my own way, trying to believe in myself and my limited abilities, I gave up. I gave up. I gave up my wicked ways. I asked God to take control of my life. I followed his will by praying and studying the word of God. And friend, I can tell you, that's the only way to obtain peace. The only way to build an armor that can protect you from this world. Living near Charlotte, I get to be around a lot of great churches. Not just my home church, which I love, Glory Bound Baptist, but there are a bunch of other ones that are great here. I like Church of Charlotte a lot. They've got an app and you can listen to sermons and whatnot. They have a saying on their website. We are a community of believers that is stirred by scripture, struggles well with life and serves others. Struggles well with life? Yeah, that's really interesting. I think a lot of people would read that and think, what, what, what are they struggling? Are they admitting they're struggling? Are they always struggling? Why are they struggling? It's profound that a fact here of a church admitting that their members struggle and that coping is so much more important than just thinking we can avoid it. But it's really true. God uses our struggles to draw us closer to him. He says it in his word. Second Corinthians 12, nine through 10. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And again, in 1 John 4, 4, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. See, faith is strengthened by turmoil. Iron is forged in fire. To shape and mold iron, it needs fire. Turmoil and struggle in life, that's the fire used to force us to depend on God. The more we depend on him and see how God protects and cares for us, the more our faith grows. It's a neat cycle and it's important. No worldly solution will do. More money just equals more problems. Grass is always greener on the other side. I've shown you that man... Even people, even one man that had it all was still left empty. God shows us the people that are poor in this world, but very rich in spirit. They are the ones that are blessed. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. You can have very little materially speaking, but if you have Jesus, you have peace and joy. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, we serve a God that gives us that comfort, that confirmation. It tells us that if we're struggling, and I'm pretty sure anybody that's listening has struggles in their life, that that's okay, that that can draw us closer to God if we so choose. Laura Story has a song called Blessings, and I'm just going to read the lyrics here of the, I guess, first verse you'd call it. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. All the while you hear each spoken need, yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? Let's pray. God, I'm praying for people to hear this and to know that obedience in Christ, to know that loving you and being all in for you is the best decision they'll ever make in life and the only way to have true peace. I'm praying that if someone's listening right now and doesn't know you, that they take this time right now to welcome Jesus into their heart, to ask for forgiveness of their sins, to repent, to come to know you, to get into a church, to serve you, 
and to live their life for you because I know they'll be happier doing that than anything ever that this earth has to offer. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen.